there's no caboose at the rear of this Amtrak train. There's something much more extraordinary. Call it a time machine. Yes, vintage, restored, one-of-a-kind rail cars like these still ride the rails today. Thanks to private owners who've spent millions taking their love of the rails to the extreme. And sometimes beyond. Get set for a look inside the most opulent, the most unusual, the most over-the-top railway cars in America. Right now on Tricked Out Trains. They're as luxurious as a custom yacht, as exclusive as a private jet, each one a mobile mansion, bringing luxurious rail travel into the 21st century. Owning and fixing up railroad cars like these requires passion, perseverance, and plenty of cash. In 1971, Amtrak took over passenger service from the freight railways and excess rolling stock had to be stored, scrapped, or sold to private owners, many of whom snapped them up at the time. To get where they want to go, these owners hire Amtrak, either paying a fee to ride at the end of a regularly scheduled train, or arranging for Amtrak to make a special run just for them and their fellow car owners like these members of the American Association of Private Railroad Car Owners. As for hopping a ride as a passenger, some owners arrange for special excursions and sell space to the public. First call for dinner. Other cars can be chartered for days or weeks at a time, and still others are reserved for the exclusive use of their owners and their invited guests. One fine example, this car its exterior, and exercise in restraint. But once you come aboard, well, prepare to enter a realm that evokes the spirit, the romance, and the mysticism of the East. Today, this over-the-top, no-expense-spared rail car is known as the Patron Tequila Express. But according to Nancy Ganier, executive director of the Traveltown Museum Foundation, it started its life as a business car used exclusively by railway president Isaac Tigret. Many of the business cars were designed for the railroad executives. It combined everything from a meeting room to a dining room. Could be the same table, but dressed differently. There was a luxurious bedroom. They could take a bath if they wanted to when they were traveling across the country. Years later, while in Amtrak colors, a fire left the car burned and smoke damage throughout. What do you do with a car that's been burned on the inside? Well, we need to kind of get rid of it. Is this going to take more to fix it up and to get it back in service than anything else? And so then it became part of a series of private owners of people. Oh, yeah, I can fix it up. Oh, I really don't have the money to fix that up. Oh, I don't want to deal with that. And interestingly, it eventually got back down to the Tigret family again. It was bought by the railroad's president's great nephew, who also had the same name of Isaac Tigret. The younger Tigret first visited his great uncle's car when he was four weeks old. But four decades later, having made a bundle as co-creator of the Hard Rock Cafe, he spent two years and an estimated two million dollars to give his great uncle's rail car its current cross-cultural design. The inside of railroad cars, they're kind of unique templates for artists. They're small enough that you can have incredible detail. And does that car have incredible detail? You can look at the pictures of it. It's almost bohemian with the amount of luxurious upholstery and the woodwork. The niceness of a small, compact car like that is you can really go overboard. Of course, if you look at the designs of the House of Blues, it's very obvious they were designed at the same time, and they wanted to evoke that same feeling of luxury and of plushness and of almost overboard exuberance. Which leads us to the car's third and current owner, entrepreneur, philanthropist, and billionaire John Paul DeJoria, who continues to preserve its ornate interiors with the care and attention it so richly deserves. The train was done last time about 23, 24 years ago, so we thought, well, after that many years, let's redo it. So we just refurbished it. You know, every piece of wallpaper, every ceiling, everything was either replaced or redone, you know, to make it look just pristine. 
We have this magical lady that works with us named Cindy. There was some wallpaper that was on this train I wanted to replace. It was all fabric, by the way. And it was so old, she found the place in France that made it, ordered it. They had one roll left, a big roll, enough to finish what we needed. Just amazing. Our room-by-room -room tour begins with a lavish private compartment where even royalty would feel right at home. Here we are in the master suite, very comfortable. 17th century, beautiful piece of art. And you may notice that the ceiling there is a special ceiling put in. It was brought in from England. And the creature comforts continue with the adjoining private bath. And its focal point, this vintage stained glass panel imported from England. You may notice the floors are all marble. The shower is extremely large. Two people could fit in it. We're, uh, we're going to take your word on that. And here in one of the guest rooms, of course, this comes down. This is a bed. It's very, very, very comfortable and very large. And this will come down so you have double berths here if you want them. Here, as in the master suite, the attention to detail is astounding. It was really, really done right. All that tucking and pleating. Even this guest compartment, you feel really, really special. And of course, once again, you watch the world in America go by. So what's the well-to-do train aficionado watch when he's not watching America go by? The answer, believe it or not, is here. Behind all of this beautiful carvings and this, this piece up here, we just twist one of those, it opens up, and all of a sudden you've got a theater in there, a state-of-the-art little theater in there. And down the hall, in a minuscule space where a bathroom once was, a rack full of technology keeps all the onboard systems humming along. But state-of-the-art electrical system throughout the whole train and upgraded everything, the TVs, the theater. Need a little snack? No problem. Just swing into a kitchen fit for a four-star chef. Or for a more serious culinary experience, why not take a seat in the formal dining room amidst museum-quality stained glass panels made in the 14th century? This becomes a table for eight. It just folds right out. The chairs pull all up here, and you can seat eight people here for a fabulous dinner. Fabulous indeed with a guest list that's included people from all walks of life, from presidents and big city mayors to entertainers ranging from the Blues Brothers to James Brown to ZZ Top and more. Each with an all-access pass to experience the kind of travel that just plain demands an encore. Its windows are round, a lot like the portholes on a boat. The engineer controls its speed using something that looks suspiciously like the wheel of a ship. And at the front, there's a nose that would be right at home on a modern day ocean liner. So, what exactly is this nautically themed conveyance? And what is it doing in the middle of landlocked Nevada? From a distance, it doesn't look all that different from any other train. It's only when it gets closer that you begin to notice its leading edge. Sharp, angular, designed to slice through the wind like a ship through water. And then there's the windows, which look and operate a lot like portholes. Yet for all the things you do see, there's one big thing you don't. There's no no locomotive, not pulling from the front, not pushing from the back. This unconventional railway car is known as a McKean car. Built in 1910 by the McKean Motor Car Company of Omaha, Nebraska, such cars were created to solve a problem that plagued railways for years. How do you operate a small route with few passengers and still turn a profit? The majority of the McKeans were commissioned by railway titan E.H. Harriman, who at one time controlled massive railways like the Union Pacific, the Southern Pacific, and the Illinois Central, just to name a few. 
And in concept, the cutting edge design looked like a surefire moneymaker. Mr. McCain realized that there was great value in a self-propelled rail car. He had, nobody had ever done this. This was the first one of this genre in the United States. The car's small size made it easier to fill every seat with paying passengers. And while steam engines of the day required a crew of two, the McKean, with its own internal combustion engine, right inside the car, could be operated by just one employee, allowing lower overhead and higher profit. It was here at the Nevada State Railway Museum that this meticulous, faithful, and painstaking 13-year-long restoration was carried out. But there was a time it looked like the car might not be restored at all because it was very much in use. Believe it or not, as offices for a plumbing company. The car came off of the railroad in 1945, was in various places as a restaurant, as a curio shop, and ultimately as a plumbing supply house. And as this video, shot by museum worker Lee Hobold, shows, the rail car and the plumbing shop were pretty much joined at the hip. When the museum was started in 1981, we approached the owner of that building and said, we would like to have that car, because we knew what it was, and we knew the history of the car. But the plumber's answer was as firm as it was devastating. He said, well, this is my office and my shop, and I'm not going to tear the building down to give you the car. But a decade later, the owner had other ideas. I want to get a shot of it before uh, they started tearing the building down. In the mid-90s, he decided to develop the property and tear that whole structure down. And when he did that, he gave us the car. He also endowed us with $20,000 to start the restoration. He was very interested in the history of the car and seeing it preserved. First step, extracting the car from the surrounding building, which requires two cranes, dozens of workers, and no small amount of elbow grease. The car was sitting in the dirt. It was sitting on the ground. It had some rocks underneath it. And so we had to excavate around the car body to, to, to make sure that we found the bottom of the car. Then after a half mile low speed road trip, it arrives at the museum's Carson City workshops and the forensic evaluation begins. We recorded every little detail we found as we took it apart. Notches in the floor, material stuffed in the walls, literally everything had to be identified, and if important to the restoration, cataloged and preserved. Just fixing the walls is a major challenge, since the wall posts inside are badly corroded, but workers can't strip away the car's skin to get to them. The skin that holds this car together we determined if we removed the skin from the car without doing something about the wall post, the car would, body would fall over. It would, it would no longer be a car body. The solution? A compromise of sorts. So we cut windows in the skin to expose the wall post framing so that we could renew the bottom ends where they were corroded and get them tightly fixed to the subframing of the car so that when we took the skin off, it didn't fall apart. That task accomplished, the team turns to, well, just about everything. We have the right curve. It was basically empty. There were no railroad appointments in it. The original floor was long gone. We know that the maple floor that was in it when we got it wasn't original. It was probably a restaurant floor because there were no holes in it for seat mountains. Yet amidst the void, some clues remain like a scrap of mahogany found inside the walls that was key to getting the car's finish just right. Because it was being sealed into the car, had its nice varnish coating on it, and told us what the original finish looked like. It was a wonderful sample. In other cases, photos from the past helped guide the restoration. We know that there was a circular bench in the back from some of the interior photographs, but it wasn't a photograph of the bench. It was a photograph of the inside of the car, and you can see that the bench was back there. But then appeared this photo of a disheveled William Jennings Bryan, perhaps best known as an attorney in the so-called monkey trials over teaching evolution in the 20s. It's a great picture of William Jennings Bryan, but it's a better picture of the upholstery and the woodwork detail. And we use that photograph to pick out upholstery patterns and, and turned leg patterns and how it was fitted in. 
And sometimes, missing pieces of the puzzle show up in the most unexpected places, like the car's original steam whistle. They tossed the whistle into a toolbox in the front of the nose. And over the years, stuff just got piled into it and on top of it. When this car was being cleaned out, we came across it. It's the original whistle off of this car, and we just put it back on and we run it. Parts are understandably difficult to obtain. So where only a single example survives, that part is used to make molds, from which identical copies are cast right on site. In other cases, the needed parts are made by hand, one at a time. For example, these grab bars. McKean, he was uh, very frugal. He did some really cheap work. But for some reason, he did some very expensive work in odd places. And we had one original one. We made all the balance of them in bronze. There we go. To make them, DeWitt uses a torch to heat forging gray bronze red hot, then bends the rod to the exact angle. Ooh then welds on feet, used to fasten the bars to the car. The unusual shape of the salon, now better known as the toilet, and we have the toilet, provided another challenge. The shape of its rounded wall was known from a pattern found on the floor, but getting the curve just right, that took real ingenuity. We hunted around for the right radius to pull the shape of the wall into, and beer kegs happened to be the right shape. And so we just appropriated a couple and, and used them. And then there's the iconic porthole-shaped windows. William McKean lived in Omaha, but he had some sort of fascination with the nautical theme. We see it not only in the portholes, but in his advertising literature. He talks about the shape of the car mimicking that of a fine sailing yacht and cutting through the wind. Uh, we see it in the architecture of the brake wheel in the front end, handbrake, which has a nautical theme. It looks like the helm of a boat. The window's operated with a screw, latch, and so to open your window, you unscrew it, you lift it up, and you hook it into the ceiling. The windows are heavy, having quarter-inch glass in them, and would probably have been a big hazard. And weight isn't the only drawback to the window's unusual design. One of the interesting things is that they always leaked, and so he dealt with the leaking of the window by putting in a scupper and a drain port on the outside you can see little brass nipples underneath all the windows where the water leaked out as it ran in through the window and if you think the passenger compartment was a challenge listen to what they had to create from scratch below the floorboards everything below the floor and also the power plant all the heavy metal if you will the, the trucks the wheels axles side frames all of that was gone because that's where the scrap value was among those heavy parts the massive wheels which drive the train, which, again, had to be cast from models built by hand by the museum's in-house craftsmen. And just like the wheels on a car, the wheels of a train need tires. In this case, custom-fit, hardened steel tires that are fitted to the wheels using a whole lot of fire. You heat the tire up with a ring of fire, which is a pipe system that burns propane and oxygen with lots of little orifices around it. Over time, the heat expands the tire just enough so that the wheel can be slid inside. And as the tire cools, it shrinks down and gets a grip on the cast iron center sufficient that it won't slip or come off. From massive steel tires to decorative paintings applied by hand, no detail has been overlooked in the McKean's historically accurate restoration. And while San Francisco's cable cars are often said to be the only national landmark that moves, well, now they've got company. The Secretary of the Interior designated the V&T McKean car number 22 as a national historic landmark. It acknowledges that this car is of historical significance to the whole United States, not just Nevada, not just Carson City, not by any means. Not bad for an old girl who once worked in the plumbing trade. What do you get when you combine a Hollywood set designer, a New York Society columnist, his longtime companion, and piles and piles of cash? Oh my God. So, 
What do you get when a Hollywood set designer, a New York Society columnist, and his longtime companion all tackle a project where money's no object? Oh, my God. That's a pretty common reaction when people see the Virginia City, an absolute confection of a rail car that's as ornate as a wedding cake, or in the opinion of Hollywood pioneer Cecil B. DeMille, as body as a bordello. He came on board the car when it was finished in L.A. He came to the back door, he looked around, he said, tell the madam I'll have a drink with her, but I'm too old to go upstairs with the girls. Built in 1928, the Virginia City was a product of the Pullman Company, best known for their Pullman sleeper cars. Back then, the most tricked out concept on two rails. George Pullman's cars became synonymous with luxury and comfort, while his competitors offered a far more Spartan experience. Traveling meant traveling on wooden benches, on cars without springs that bounced and, and jounced along depending on how, how well made the rail was. Pullman combined springy suspension with plush, comfortable seats. Seats that also converted into cozy beds at night. And the passengers loved it. It's the comfort, it's the elegance, it's, it's the style that people were willing to pay for. The Virginia City first rode the rails between San Francisco and Chicago, and later ran on the Golden State Limited between Chicago and Los Angeles. Then came the war. Just as World War II broke out, it was parked in the Pullman lot, used car lot, so to speak, and sat there until after World War II when Lucius Beebe and Charles Clegg purchased the car. Lucius Beebe lived an extravagant life in New York, and his society column in the Herald Tribune was the most read feature of its kind, bar none. But then he and companion Charles Clegg embarked on a fateful journey. And they took a trip west to Virginia City, Nevada, and just fell in love with the town. Lucius said any town that had one school and 20 saloons had to be not bad. Together, they put down roots, bought a house, and brought a local newspaper back to life. In Virginia City, they restarted the Territorial Enterprise, which is the newspaper where Mark Twain got his start. And they had it while they had it. It was a weekly newspaper, had the largest circulation of a weekly paper west of the Mississippi. Saving a paper is one thing, but rescuing a rail car? That's where the big bucks come in. Bebe and Clegg bought the car from Pullman Company for $5,000 and spent $350,000 on it, which translates today to about two and a half million. So what's that sort of money buy you? Well, let's start with the decorations. The interior was remodeled by Robert Hanley of Hollywood, and he went on a shopping trip to Europe, mostly around Northern Italy, brought back a lot of antiques, and furnish the car. The dining room table and chairs are over 200 years old. Actually, they're probably pushing on 250 years old now. The chandeliers are from Murano, Italy, hand-blown glass. You'll also get a set of four mismatched lamps that are sure-fire conversation starters. To a world traveler, they represent the four corners of the known traveling world, which would be Asia, the Far East, Polynesia, and Africa. And for those chilly nights, what could be better than a roaring fire? The fireplace is Italian marble. It does a very nice job of heating the car up. You know, we use it in the wintertime on our winter trips. And to top it off, something that truly reflects your taste and refinement. Above the fireplace, we have a mirror that dates from the late 18th century which I was told by a fellow from the Smithsonian to never touch it. It's probably worth what the car is worth as an antique. Someday I might have it appraised. <laughs> These days, the car continues to ride the rails, bringing America's splendor so close you can touch it. When you can be on a train and step out to the back platform and just take in everything that's going on out there, when you're going through the Rockies, on the way to Colorado, across the desert, or just through the Sierras, or down the coast to LA. You, you see things that you can't see. Obviously, you can't see it from an airplane. And if you're driving, you're not gonna see it at all. 
And if all that sightseeing has tired you out, why not grab a nap in your own private cabin? With bath, naturally, and featuring historically accurate fixtures like fold-away sinks, brass-bladed fans, hand-painted murals, why, even the hardware on the privacy shades, completely authentic. And when it's time for dinner, have a seat under this oh-so-elegant Baroque chandelier. Pull up a chair to the massive marble top table and try to imagine what it was like to be a guest of B.B. and Clegg. To be waited on on all your meals served on China, custom-made China for the car with linens, brought right to you, fine wines. Sure, it's not for everyone, but if you've got the dough, maybe owning a rail car is for you. Connie Luna at Key Holidays said it best. Owning a private railroad car makes purchasing a yacht seem like a sound financial investment. Or maybe not. Awesome. Bye guys, see ya. At first glance, with its distinctive orange and maroon colors gleaming through the late fall foliage, it looks like something from another time. Maybe even another planet. But this is no UFO. Step up and come aboard a railway passenger car whose out-of-this-world design had a very down-to-earth purpose. A purpose that, for the railroads, was a matter of life and death. With its distinctive colors and otherworldly design, this one-of-a-kind rail car was built for one purpose and one purpose only to lure back rail passengers from a competitor whose business was just beginning to take off. Airlines. My name is Tom Burton, and I'm a ticket agent for the Milwaukee Road. I'm sure you would find it the most delightful trip you've ever had. When the Hiawatha debuted, flying would have been very laborious. The planes were uncomfortable, unpressurized, so your, you know, your ears would be popping. So the railroads decided, well, we're going to promote luxury. Individual air conditioning controls running ice water. There's nothing like this on any other railroad. Starting in the summer of 1947, these distinctive cars began operation as part of the Olympian Hiawatha service, which whisked passengers from Chicago, west of the Cascade Mountains and beyond, all the way to Seattle. And the Hiawatha ran regularly at 100 to 110 miles an hour. So it was actually fairly speedy to ride the train at the time. I'm the old Milwaukee. Faster than cars and more comfortable than flying, these trains promise the ultimate in modern design and passenger comfort. The car was actually built in 1948 and it was designed by a very famous industrial designer. At the time, they called him Stylist. That stylist? Acclaimed industrial designer Brooke Stevens, whose futuristic concepts included everything from this now collectible Studebaker Hawk to an Evinrude boat, meant to fly like a helicopter. If you remember the Oscar Mayer Wienermobile, he designed and, and styled that. And he designed things like the Miller Beer logo, Harley Davidson. Yes, the chrome and steel machine that's become synonymous with macho was designed by the guy behind the Wienermobile. Even more astounding, these amazing designs were accomplished in a time when precise calculations were done on slide rules and plans were all drawn by hand. This car is extremely unique in that its geometric design in 1948 used all flat glass. There's no curved glass anywhere in it. Of course, with today's modern era, they would just use a computer to figure all that out. So this was all figured out mathematically on a drawing board. The uniqueness of this car was the fact that you could carry on a conversation with an individual while the scenery was going on behind the person you were talking to. Today, the car is owned, operated, and preserved by the nonprofit Friends of the 261, which takes its name from the steam locomotive that was the organization's first acquisition. 
but much of the credit for the car's survival also goes to Brooke Stevens himself. There was four of these cars and they were uh, scrapping them. They had actually physically burned one because of the wood interior. So he had inquired about purchasing one and they sold it to him for $2,500. At the time he complained and they threw in a new carpeting and new chairs for him. Thanks to the designer's foresight, today families spanning three generations are able to speed along the banks of the Mississippi, enjoying the same experience as well-heeled passengers in days gone by. We've tried to leave it as much original as possible. The wool carpeting in here is actually original from 1965. They're aluminum deco, art deco style seating. And the whole car is really designed with kind of an Art Deco 1948 genre. The car's just got a fabulous patina to it, blonde quarter sawn oak wood with mahogany inlaid in it in the luggage racks here. The shades and all the upholstery in the car is original from the 19, early 1960s. You can see the seat numbers over each one of the seats, the small fold-out tables, and the colors are actually matched to the original colors that the car was painted in. This has some modern amenities, obviously modern air conditioning, modern restrooms, but as far as what the customer is going to see, they're going to see the original interior as it was in the 1950s and 60s. Just flip up the full length leg rest, lower the back of the chair, stretch out and relax. Even today, the train continues to attract a new generation of fans including this couple who just got hitched. We were married yesterday. And are spending their honeymoon riding the rails. The first week in November, we're going to DC and riding Amtrak's President's Dome Car back to Chicago. So, could this be the start of another generation of rail fans? Who knows? But as the old saying goes, if the trains are rocking, don't come a knocking. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Conductor Bill here. Welcome aboard the Central Coast Flyer. <music> Folks, you are riding on a vintage train car built in 1949. In addition to tempting libations and scenery second to none, this vintage restored Pullman lounge car offers willing passengers a once in a lifetime experience, requiring sharp instruments, a steady hand, and a whole lot of trust. This is no drill. Many people this morning thought I was kidding, but no. There was a time when business travelers crisscrossed the country by train, enjoying the ultimate in service. In rail cars like this completely restored first class Pullman lounge. And completely restored it was because when conductor Bill Hattrick bought it, there was very little left inside. Well, it was definitely in the fixer-upper category. The entire lounge behind me was gone. They took out the table and seat cushions, even the center dinettes, gone. So to turn this shell into a show place, the owner turned to skills even he didn't know he had. I don't consider myself a craftsman or anything, but it really called upon some latent abilities. I went to night school to learn how to upholstery, to do all the upholstery. Some of the chairs I had to construct from scratch. And today, this classic Pullman lounge car is a living reminder of a time when a coast-to-coast -coast trip could take the better part of three days. And so to pass the time, there were diversions like this classic quarter circle bar, offering top shelf libations to sip with fellow travelers. Then of course, there's the scenery. As the train made its way along the so-called Overland route between Oakland and Chicago, following the path of America's first historic transcontinental railway. But today, we're on a public excursion to one of California's popular wine districts 
while traveling along some 100 miles of stunning California coastline. But it's not all sipping and sightseeing on this train. Back in the day when the streamliner was the way to travel, the businessman would usually take advantage of services like the barber shop. That's right, the Overland Trail is the only train running where you can get a trim at over 70 miles an hour. And a haircut was just one of the services you could have enjoyed while speeding down the rails. On most railroads, the barber shop also had a shower bath and typically the barber was also a ballet and would have a pressing iron. So there you had it. Shower, haircut, press your suit, ready for business at your destination city. Just step right off, ready to go to business. First call for dinner. For owner Bill Hattrick, the business of offering public rail excursions arguably started on a much smaller scale. Well, I like to say I'm a, a model railroader gone rogue. I started out with model trains. My grandpa was a railroader, and he instilled a love of trains in me. And he even built a two-inch scale railroad around the house. That's big enough to ride on. That's a big scale train, two inches to the foot. So I had no choice but to fall in love with trains. And as conductor Bill's love of trains grew, he eventually made the jump from scale models to the real thing. When I saw this car, I saw the potential. But when I saw the barber shop, which was missing the chair and the sink and even the mirrors, but the cabinetry was there, I immediately recognized what it was. I said, oh my god, this is a real railroad barber shop. I had never seen one, only pictures. And that's what really sold me on the car. Thanks for telling me this. So the next time you're due for a trim, remember the Overland Trail for a haircut that's just about as old school as it gets. We're glad you're here today, folks. Thanks for riding the Central Coast Flyer. This is the tricked out train that will forever link Barack Obama and Abraham Lincoln. God bless the United States of America. Well, part of me can't help but think that Mr. Obama wanted to experience the same thing that Abraham Lincoln did. The outside of the beautiful royal blue Georgia 300 reflects history. The inside preserves it. The clocks all work, but this is a place where time stands still. Polished cherry wood lines the hallways and adorns the curved ceilings. Elegance of a time gone by still lives here. The Georgia 300 was built back in 1930 by the Pullman Standard Company. This blueprint shows how it was originally designed into a 10-section mid-train sleeper car. The inside has been restored several times in the past 83 years, but still has the same basic design. Despite being 82 and a half feet long, it's only nine feet wide. Still, it has a full kitchen that's been upgraded to stainless steel and is about the size of a walk-in closet, just big enough to feature a tiny version of a grill found in some of the finest steakhouses. The Georgia 300 also has a lounge a dining room, and three bedrooms. The master with its own phone, a mini armoire, a bathroom equipped with a special silver water bottle, and a personal Pullman brass fan. The Georgia 300 is just an incredible example of lushness, of, of elegance. This Rolls-Royce of the rails first traveled from New Orleans to New York. It was later used to shuttle the rich and famous to the Masters Golf Tournament and the Kentucky Derby. The Georgia 300 was pulled off the tracks in 1982, but brought back to life by Jack Hurd, who bought the Royal Blue Beauty in 86. 
Jack had to have the car rewired and renovated from top to bottom. He did it all, trying to preserve the beauty of a time gone by. This room is original as it was originally built by the Pullman Company. It has the upper berth, which can come down for sleeping, and the section here can come together, a mattress placed, bed made up, and two people can sleep. Jack doesn't know exactly how much he spent fully restoring the Georgia 300. Or maybe he's just not telling us. But he spared no expense. From the fine china to the silver napkin rings, nothing has been ignored. The Georgia 300 could be called the modern day express line to the White House. Thank you very much, Wilmington. President Barack Obama and his family climbed aboard this regal rail car for his first inauguration. The Obama-Biden team followed in Abraham Lincoln's tracks from Philadelphia to the White House. God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. Abraham Lincoln was a great president. I think uh, Obama liked to tap into that and feel that they were both from Illinois. I think Mr. Obama sort of wanted to reenact that to see what it feels like. Sometimes there's nothing better than walking in a man's shoes, or in this case, maybe riding on the same rails that he did. President Bill Clinton also used the Georgia 300 to get his campaign on track in 1996. This train is on the right track to the 21st century, and I want you to keep us on it. But George Bush Sr. was the first president to hitch a ride on the Georgia 300, trying to recreate the magic of Harry Truman's famed whistle stop tour. I think when you travel by train, you become immediately approachable. You're, you're literally on the ground. You're able to step out of the back porch and speak to the people and be face to face with them right there at the end of a train. And also the magic of being able to step in a door and be whisked away was something I think would really add to a, a campaign. The proud Georgia 300 still rides the rails for special occasions, pulled around like a caboose at the end of an Amtrak train a piece of American history that could be back on track in a future election.